third bliss and peace that he should have expected. So now we go on, that well-earned rest, the inward peace, peace and bliss, the expected retreat, however, that what he's looking for, it didn't happen. And instantly, as soon as he started to move off his uh, right method, he saw that the mind, just like that, left. The, at that instant, the body seemed to break into two parts. With a simultaneous and automatic knowledge that beyond doubt, this is the right way. This condition of one poignantness was characterized by the firm establishment of mindfulness of the body, thus preventing the mind from wandering aimlessly outside. So he was able to use this to keep the mind from what he calls aimlessly wandering outside. It was this introspective method that he adopted and later ad adapted and modified for higher practices and efforts. Again, he's developing this on his own. Remember, he doesn't have a teacher. So he's trying to figure out how can he control this mind wandering, uh, getting wild, and then use it deeper and deeper and deeper. This was a vital turning point of his life of earnest practice. The previous three months had been wasted in curiosity's chase after visions, a drawback of not having a competent meditation master's guidance and supervision. At the least, it causes unnecessary delay, while at the worst, it leads a seeker astray and drives him to various evils and miseries. Clear what that's about? So he's saying he came upon this luckily after wasting months seeking these states, chasing after them. Um, finally, he found a method to hold his mind and then realized that he was very lucky. He says this later in his autobiography. Uh, he could have gone off the deep end, so to speak. He could have gone after these states and gone spiritually mad, a kind of spiritual madness. And other texts talk about this too. So madness is not limited just to what we consider madness, but you can be uh, as um, kind of divinely mad, if that makes sense to you. I'll show you a poem tonight to go into that a little bit. His inner struggle would then actively begin once again with more effort being progressively made towards hunting down the defilements within. Defilements is the translation for the klesha, the afflictions, fan now. There's no need to describe in what ways a struggle such as this beset with difficulties and defeats. Now, what he's going into a little bit is what Hanchan has been talking about. When you enter this state of practice and concentration, when you start to deal with klesha defilements, um, then they sort of rear their ugly, ugly head, so to speak, and distract you. So there's something in the practice of concentration that is pushing you on uh, for, for this attention, this mindfulness to, to see the spiritual nature and to get uh, clear. At the same time, there's a resistance from within. And so this battle, so to speak, is going on within between that desire or the aspiration for clarity and calm and then this resistance born from karma and a lot of just ego mismanagement, if you want to use that word, uh, that's built up, and now the real struggle begins. And you can be sitting here, and you can look like a Buddha statue, and nobody will know that that struggle is going on. If you don't wrinkle your brow or twitch your face or do anything and just sit there like you're unmoving, nobody would see that there's anything going on. And yet... An immense amount can be going on. It often happens that the fighter is the one being fought, <laughs> and the hunter is the one being hunted. Of course, metaphors. In other words, he's the fighter, but he's being struggled against. He's being fought by these states. And he's the hunter after his awakening, or what he says of this bliss, um, and um, what did he call it? inward bliss and peace that he wanted, but in fact, he often feels like he's the prey being hunted. In other words, he's running, in a sense, from the own energy and the states of his own mind. 
defilements, instead of being consumed, often turned out to be the consumers. <laughs> Meaning, this isn't about buying, it means to consume, to, uh, to take in and eat up. So instead of you burning them up, they start to take you over. All the former good intentions and ideals of the aspirant going up in smoke. <laughs> this is beautiful. Remember what Hanshan was talking about earlier? You set your mind on it, you're really uh, ready to go, and then all of a sudden, these states come and you just feel so dejected that you just want to throw in the... Remember, he talked about this. And he said, at this point, you need to have patience and discernment. Um, defilements, this, I love this, are crafty. <laughs> He's, he's kind of personalizing it now. He, you know, there's a little personification going on. Is that acceptable or not? What do you all think? Defilements are crafty in wielding their powers and sabotage. Well, it's for sure it's what he's experienced. Um, many, many people who cultivate uh, find it very uh, effective to personalize these afflictions. I mean, if you look at the Platform Sutra, the Six Patriarchs says what? The, the second of the vows, the living beings, are, I vow to liberate them all, right? And then he says, so who are these living beings? Well, it's all those confused people who aren't Buddhists out there, right? No, <laughs> he said it's, it's the living beings of your own nature. So again, he personalizes it and says, the living beings of your own nature are the first living beings you need to take across. And then he lists them as the klesha. But it's almost like they got legs and arms and they got a, an image to them. You can play with this a little bit, it's kind of fun. Uh, mine turned out to be a little brat uh, that was bugging me. I, I thought it was a monster, you know, this huge thing. And then it just, I caught it and it turned out to be just a little naughty child, an insecure brat, and then it stopped. So they're, they're crafty, though, in wielding their powers of sabotage. Right before your eyes, they can lull you into their power and keep us all at bay. So he's, he's describing, <clears throat> this is very vivid uh, language of what one experiences. You do feel as if you're in this struggle. You do feel as if these are almost beings that have this power, and yet, these are just the inner dimensions of your consciousness and all its manifestations. Um, and you might, you might have a whole theater full of Klesha actors that you've created that now come uh, for their due. <laughs> Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Some of you got a feel for this. It was only the Buddha who was first able to eradicate them once and for all from his mind and who, having achieved such a decisive victory, was overwhelmed with compassion for the suffering people and took pains to blaze a trail for those pioneering spirit. So this is a real um, acknowledgement on his part, I think, both for the richness of this tradition that he is heir to, and at the same time, a kind of lament, because he doesn't have the teacher. He doesn't have a teacher, right. A number of people who cared and who dared to follow in his footsteps took up the struggle with courage and patience. And again, see the language again? Courage and patience. In other words, this subduing, this regulating, this mastery over one's mind, one's consciousness, one's body and emotions and feelings is considered to be the most uh, courageous of endeavors. Sutra in 42 sections saying conquering others is fairly easy but to subdue this, really tough. And again, you don't look like a great hero sitting here like a little mushroom on a pillow. <laughs> but it's the work of great heroes. My teacher used to say the greatest things begin in the smallest of places, meaning right at that spot is where everything turns. You turn that as it goes out, it manifests. If you don't turn that, there's nothing. So, took up the struggle with courage, backed by an unshakable faith, and who later became known as the third gem of the triple gem, the Sangha, or noble disciples in the best sense of that term. 
Now the narrator, this is the narrator's voice here. Fra Ajahn Mun was also following this path with devotion and unwavering confidence. So the narrator, the, the author of this, who is interjecting his voice in this, that's why I say it's not quite an autobiography. There's a, there's a little bit of editorializing uh, going on. The unshakable faith, um, we should just look at for a little bit. What does that mean to you? He, he says a number of people who undertook to do this, took up the struggle with courage and patience, backed, supported by unshakable faith. Now, what's that? Um, the, the, question, the question sort of is, what was the faith in? You know, usually you think of faith is towards something. Usually the word that follows faith, I have faith in. So where is this faith directed? Where is it positioned towards? Could be. Could be. Um, the notion of faith generally in Buddhism is, first of all, that it's um, instrumental, not final. In other words, you take it up as a expedient method uh, as you work through the experiment. And then faith is, quote, rewarded not by um, eternal faith, but by gnosis, by insight, by prajna. So faith becomes a, a raft, so to speak, to get you on the journey, a hypothetical that you're using to start with. But faith should be confirmed more and more by understanding and insight till eventually there really isn't any faith. There's just insight, prajna, understanding, wisdom. So faith is not an end but a means to an end. And part of it, I think, is true. It's the process. And part of what he's saying the triple jewel is to, is to maintain that methodology, to pass it on. But there's something deeper here. And that's, I think, the faith in his own being, the faith in himself. Because unless you have faith in your own ability to do this, why would you undertake such a difficult thing? So it's not arrogance. I, I want to be really clear because sometimes we feel, oh, I can do anything, you know, we can set our minds. It's not that kind of faith, but it's a, a sort of deep, even little raw conviction, I can do this. I can do this. It's, it's worth doing. I can do this. I need some help. I need a method. But if I stay with it, there's something inside that mm, lifts you up in that way. It's a very important thing to have. So it's not just faith in the triple jewel, but there's a faith in your own mind, in your own being that's really important. Because... Right, and that will support the faith as a hypothesis. So the more feedback you get, the more you realize the faith is well-placed and you can move on and not have to question and doubt so much. Now, there is a role for doubt. This is what's interesting. But it's not to doubt that you have the ability to do it. It's to doubt the illusion of the self or the ego that's doing it. And that's a constructive faith. Uh, Jury talks about this too, destructive and constructive faith. Destructive faith means, oh, I'm not, I couldn't do this. I, I, I don't have the ability. Um, I'm not worthy. Um, I'm, I'm too weak. I'm sinful, blah, blah, blah. I'm lazy. Um, I like being lazy. I don't think I can change, you know, so forth like this. That kind of voice, uh, Jerry calls destructive faith. Constructive faith is the faith that you have that this can be done, that the method is a reliable method, and that you will be, quote, rewarded with progress in markers such as loss of um, hatred, animosity, clation, and so forth. And so, that's where the faith resides. But if you don't have faith in yourself, the danger with this is that you turn your faith other directed. And this is, gets to a point where it's looking outside. So there's this tension in Buddhism about 
faith in the method, faith in the example of the Buddha, the Bodhisattvas, or a great teacher you met, and then having faith in yourself. Because if you just have faith in them, it then turns into this kind of dependency where you're, you're getting into a savior mentality that they are going, then going to save you. And that's the, that's the tension here. So you have to have enough faith to begin, but you can't let that faith become total in the other. Yeah, it's tricky stuff. Okay. So having finished his meal, we're on, uh, he would uh, proceed to a uh, specially cleared track for walking meditation practice. You've, some of you have seen this practice, right? The, the, in the Theravada tradition, they create like, like this rug. If you just extend it, it's kind of a space. And they, and they, they don't walk like we walk in Chan. We, lo- we walk in Chan like people at a mall for a sale. <laughs> you see the Chan walking, we do. And then they go, run. And you run, and then you stop and sit. This mindfulness walking really looks like you've got a slow motion camera going. And of course, it's good for one thing. I mean, it's good to walk, but it's good for the other thing, which is your mind is going, I want to go faster. It doesn't like to slow down. So the body walking like this helps put a little harness on the mind. The remainder of the day devoted to the eradication of the defilements, not a bad way to spend your day, which bind all human beings to the cycle of endless births and deaths. He never allowed defilements to mock him or to make a fool of him. This is really interesting language. What, what would that be like? How would the defilements mock and make a fool? Come on, you've all heard them. What do they say? What? You can't do it. That's one thing it says. Stupid. Everybody's out having fun. What are you doing? <laughs> sure, the Buddha did it. Are you a Buddha? No way, man. <laughs> you're not even a filial child. And you're dumb. You didn't get into that PhD program. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. All this sort of mock. And then it'll mock you like, yeah, you're sitting there, but look what your mind's doing. A lot of people are fooled that you look like a Buddha. But your mind's just a circus. Ha, ha, ha. Try to control. It'll, this voices will come up in your meditation. Gee, I'm wasting the best part of my life doing this. I should be out making my career. This is the mock. Hmm. I could go on, but I don't want to get, give you ideas. <laughs> I'm sure you'll come up with your own here. <laughs> you'll find your own mockery <laughs> and ways to be made a fool of. Right. It's good to do this because, on one hand, you objectify it in that way. You don't give it a reality. You you say, oh, so this thing is coming to mind. Now, you recognize it's your own mind. But by objectifying it in a certain way, it gives you some leverage to confront it. Whereas you feel, oh, this is me. This is over, this is me overwhelming me. If you can just, there's a kind of tension where you objectify just a little bit to get a handle. My teacher used to, this one he'd say, okay, so when you start to sit in meditation, the mocking mind will go, um, I can't do it. It hurts too much. It's stupid. I'm hungry. I want lunch. What are you having for lunch? I don't want, it's been 45. I'm going to get, I'm going to go. And he, and he would say, so turn that into a baby voice, a child, a little brat. And then you, and he would give this example. So he'd say, now, now, here, here. I came to do this. It's a very serious matter. Most of my life has been chasing frivolous things. I really have a seven-day chance here to do something serious. I'm going to sit. Huh? Yes, I'm going to sit here. Now, if you want to act up and run around, that's okay. I'm still going to sit here. Hmm? Yeah, we're not leaving. <laughs> he would do this thing back and forth, and he says, now, if you're really good, at the end of seven days, I'll go out and give you a treat. What are you going to get? So he, he would do this thing back and forth, and it was just an expedient so you can negotiate with this inner voice. And invariably, you know, the, the kid would quiet down 
thinking I'm going to get a reward at the end of the retreat or something, and then be tricked into, hey, this is pretty cool. <laughs> Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. So here's, here's another dynamic tension. So while you use these expedients, you go back to the six patriarchs expression, let the mind remain unattached, clinging to nothing. So now you're going back. You're using it, but you're not identifying with it. You're not clinging to it. So there's this nimble thing that you're doing where you pick up an expedient you need to get through something. As soon as you're through it, you drop off again. And you even forget what expedient you use. You're just constantly shifting gears and you're staying very nimble and alert. Because as soon as you set up any place, you're right. So your language is, I mean, you used a modern expression, but it could be used for non-attachment, non-grasping, which is you get hung up. Yeah. To get hung up is to get stuck. So at the same time, you have to use something, but you pick them up as just these tools you need um, to get through this. But you don't hang on to them as, this is my meditation, or this is what, what it's going to work me forever. It may not. Oh, for sure. No, no. In, in fact, I, in fact, to make it clear, what I didn't visualize it. Uh, this was during a Chan retreat, um, and so the voices of mockery and whatnot, and impatience and irritation and blah 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 was just going on and on, and I kept trying to sit and trying to sit, and it was like I could feel the struggle, and finally, somehow through just uh, effort, mindfulness, it's like I turned my head, <laughs> although I didn't turn my head and saw behind me this brat. And it was like, oops, got caught. And after that, it just died down. No, that's just a state. This isn't just another state. Um, I didn't try to imagine the brat. I just saw it as a brat, which took all the power out of it. it it's sort of like um, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. You know, she's going and there's this, mm, you know, who, who's the Oz, the wizard, right? Blah, blah, blah. And she's, oh, my God, they're all along. And then she pulls the curtain back. And there's just this little wimp in there doing all the levers and dials and creating this whole thing. Sort of like that is another kind of way you can imagine these clasia driven you know, living beings. Uh, they don't have anything really substantial to them. So, but right. Stay nimble. Even if that came up, you move on. You don't say, okay, now I saw the brat. Where's that brat? And it's like... Gone. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. He's... Huh? <laughs> Jeez, you, should, you think I should have invited him back? I mean, I don't know where he went. No. <laughs> he never came back. <laughs> yeah, they're called students. Let's go. <laughs> he steadily increased his practice of meditation, and of his insight was continually strengthened, both being developed together and in conjunction with each other. Ah, here you have the reciprocity. With the increase of practice of meditation, insight comes. With insight, meditation gets easier. So this is the back and forth between Practice and understanding, the non-duality of practice. With practice comes understanding. With understanding, the practice deepens and gets more refined and makes more sense. As that happens, understanding, and this becomes a self-perpetuating dynamic, reciprocity. Except occasionally his practice was steadily promoted and he enjoyed the bliss which resulted from this. There were times, however, when he encountered problems which seemed unsolvable and he seemed to be 
end in a blind alley. Again, going back to Han Chan's earlier piece, almost identical. Due to the lack of a competent teacher, he had to depend on his own strenuous struggles. Str struggles caused delays before the problem could be solved and the blind alley forced open. And such obstacles always threaten to breed danger and evil. This confirmed the truth, the importance of a Kalyana Mitra, uh, basically a, a, a wise and insightful knowing teacher, mentor, to an aspirant in the mind development, which was also mentioned by the Buddha. Lack of this Kalyana Mitra, on the other hand, caused both delays and dangers and is a serious drawback for all aspirants. So, uh, we just went over a passage of text this week. Uh, we're doing a, uh, a seminar with the Platform Sutra, and somebody came up with the, the six patriarch says, seek within yourself, do not seek outside. You have the wherewithal to become fully awakened. And then somebody said, but what about the Kalyana Mitra then? Isn't that like seeking outside? Why would you seek outside for a teacher when you're supposed to look within? And what was the conclusion, Stacy? Um, Since you were in the class. When This is, she's actually quoting the text of the, the, the sixth patriarch says, do not misunderstand me talking about a good and wise advisor, a Kalyana Mitra, to mean that you can't do it without one. You certainly can. If you have clarity and you have the roots that are strong enough and you don't need the teacher to do this, then go ahead and do it. On the other hand, if you don't have that, don't be foolishly thinking, I don't need a teacher. Go and find one and use one to the degree that you need to get to be self-sustaining, self-supporting. So there's, a, there's a, a call here you have to make. He, facing these states, wishes he had but did not have. And now reflecting on how, if he had one, much of this could have been avoided. Again, people point to how fortunate he was to actually go along and make progress in his cultivation and not get permanently distracted without a teacher. It's not so usual. A lot of people just go astray and never find their way back uh, without that kind of advice and support. He was able to do it at the same time, realized that he wasted a lot of time and went down a lot of dead ends. But again, his strength is that he was able to come back from that. Pretty remarkable. So the Sixth Patriarch is pointing to this. Again, the good and wise advisor is essential if you're confused and don't know what you're doing. But if you're not confused, then you just go ahead with your practice. Okay, so there's a kind of, again, just like faith. Sometimes on his wanderings, he accompanied this other monk, uh, Ajahn Sao, his meditation master. When he asked Sao to solve his problems, however, Ajahn Sao merely said it was beyond his experience, and therefore he could offer no solution. Now, what he's talking about here is what? Ajahn Sao is another forest tradition monk, a little older than he is, but he's really not a Kalyana Mitra. He's just a little bit more stable than I, but he can't give him the kind of advice he wants to get for these specific states. This happens quite frequently. You're in a community of practitioners, but nobody's advanced enough or clear enough to give you advice on all the states that you encounter. You wish. You could just say, teacher, what is... And the mistake, of course, is to pretend you know the answer when you don't. That's malpractice. <laughs> if you think about it, this, this is a medical kind of thing. So you have to be careful. Um, one of the reasons why we use the text, the Dhamma and the Vinaya, the Dhamma Vinaya, the Dharma Vinaya, is because it serves the place of that teacher. It's not as lively, it's not as direct, it's not as spontaneous as having the teacher. But it's a lot better than having nothing at all. In fact, the Buddha encouraged his disciples to take the Dhamma Vinaya as their teacher in the absence of the Kalyana Mitra. Now that means you have to interpret more, you have to read and study more carefully, but you still can have some guidance even if you can't find that teacher. Your mind is so fleeting, see... <laughs> Uh, for Ajahn Sao is 
really nailed him here. He says, your mind is so fleeting, it tends to go to extreme. One moment it soars high into the sky, another plunges deep into the earth, then it rushes under the ocean, again darting high into the air. Who on earth will be able to overtake such a mind? You must check it yourself and solve your own problems. Well, he is kind of a good friend in the way, if you think about it. He doesn't say, oh, you're awesome because you can sit for three hours and you eat one meal a day or something. He says, no, your mind is like a monkey. It's like a monkey on turbocharge, in fact. It's just zooming all over the place. I couldn't do anything here. You need to subdue it yourself. But, so at least he gives them sound advice. Um, I was sort of stopped in my tracks. I'd done a long practice and you know, thought I'd made a, a lot of progress. And then my teacher just came up to me and said, well, how's it going? Oh, pretty good. Uh, did you subdue your mind yet? Uh. <laughs> just, okay, back to the drawing board. It was just, just like that. Either you have or you haven't. <laughs> Even after you discover the right way, his mind often stole away. Do mm. you see this language he uses? It's really easy. He uses spiritual sightseeing, ch curiosity chasing, and now he says the mind would often stole away. This is what happens when you're in the retreat. Your mind and body both steal away. You're sitting there and you think, hmm... You know, just take a little break. Mm -hmm. Let's see what's in the kitchen. Yeah, go down to the tell me store. <laughs> you get off the eggs that you're sitting on because the heat becomes unbearable. He would stole away when it attained degree to one point in this. It would then reach out, becoming aware of a variety of things never dreamed of before. Sometimes it darted to the heavenly realms admiring the joys and glories to be found there for hours. You all do this, right? <laughs> so listen, the guy's got some skill, all right? <laughs> we can go to the heavenly realms by renting a video and looking at it at home or imagining, but he actually went there. This means consciousness is leaving the body and darting about. It happens, Okay? You can do this. You can get a certain level, and this is what happens. So if you don't have real kung fu there, man, it's just like giving the kid a credit card and the Malibu and saying, have a good time. It's gone. <laughs> okay? So even now, more do you have to have more solidity when this happens, when the mind and consciousness leaves the body. <laughs> okay. Sometimes, and then at other times, it plunged into the hells, touring them. Step right up, folks. We have a triple-decker bus taking on you a tour of the Vichy hells. You'll notice on your right, endless suffering, blah, blah. <laughs> taking pity on the beings they're suffering, the fruits of their former deeds. He's not doing this in a laughing manner. He's actually seeing the reality of different realms of existence, if you will. And these are traveled through consciousness. This is not space travel. Okay, and he's seen both the heavens and the hells. And he basically, it could be an awakening experience, but at the same time, it's kind of a diversion too. You see, that's where he's going with this. Most of us will divert not by going to the heavens or hells. We'll just find inner things to contemplate, right? Like, good, nobody knows. Laundry, yeah. What else? Where does your mind dart off to? Come on. <laughs> food. Good. Good food, too, right? <laughs> Worries, plans, long-term, short-term plans. <clears throat> people you imagine will save you, people that are disappointing you. Uh, what's wrong with the job? What's right with the job? <clears throat> How living in a different part of the country or the world would be better than living here? Where else do you dart off to? Buy? Yeah, you make a shopping list. Yeah, those little yellow pin-up things, you got them all in your mind. Poster, the post them things. After the retreat, you need to get a really nice meditation cushion. <laughs> okay, so, but his is darting off beyond that. He's darting off to the heavens and hells. Uh, he often engaged himself in such sightseeing tours. Whoa. 
not paying attention to the time that he was wasting. At that stage, he was not yet equipped with discriminating wisdom, able to distinguish real experiences from false or imaginary ones. He would later advise his disciples that these kinds of adventuring should be attempted only after the mind is well equipped with the protection of discriminating wisdom in order to prevent an undue absorption and self-delusion. For a nimble and dynamic mind, even a split second not guarded by mindfulness is enough, is enough to let it escape and become attuned, attached to external circumstances. After the mind has been well trained and controlled, it becomes invaluable when deliberately sent forth to pick up messages from the outside. Whatever that means. Now, if you read the text, one of the stages that happens to cultivators, especially as they enter into the arhat and the bodhisattva levels, is this ability to what they call travel. Okay? And sometimes it's manifest as, quote, transformation bodies, hua shun. Sometimes it's manifested in different ways, but they have the ability to be in a number of places at the same time. Whatever you want to call that, it's a spiritual ability or penetration. However, what this is saying and what the texts say is this is not extraordinary, but rather an ordinary ability we all have that's unrealized or untapped. So it's not like it's some kind of special power, but rather an unused or undeveloped ability we have in ourselves. At the same time, uh, all of this stuff can get very tricky if you don't have solid grounding and vows of compassion and so forth. So why you're going is to help and liberate. And for example, look at the Earth Store Sutra. After who got in, awakened? Who's a, huh? Who, who had the awakening and then went to look for his mother? Right. So he has an awakening. He has this ability now. And he doesn't go on a sightseeing tour. His first thought is, where is my mother? My mother has passed on. In what realm? And he goes, he uses this ability to go and see that his mother's in this particular hell. And he wants to help her, but he doesn't have the ability. So he comes back and the Buddha says, collectively, if you all work together... You can then. So we're going into something here that seems to us, some of us may say, whoa, this is what Buddhism really gets me. I just like, give me the practical here and now stuff. But you can see the interesting thing about these biographies, autobiographies, he's not the only one. I can, we, we have many examples. They talk about this matter-of-factly. Like you say, well, I went to the mall today and then I went down to the Social Security office. And then I had dinner. And they said, well, I went to the hells, and I went to the heavens, and then I came back. And they don't talk about it like, wow, I went. There's a later passage that's really great. He says he got to a certain level, and during the day, the villagers would come up and bring food offerings and medicine, and they'd ask for a teaching. He'd say, okay, now. The Buddha said, be kind to each other. Don't hurt each other. Don't cheat on each other's wives, and then keep your families together. Um, and don't kill so much. And he said they were full. That was enough. You tell them any more, they'd fall asleep. And even that was really hard for them to hold. Then at night when he was meditating, he said the devas and maharagas <laughs> and came for Dharma instruction. And he said he would lecture on the abstruse levels of prajna paramita, and they would sit spellbound for the whole night. And he presents this, just as I would say, on Friday night some students came to my class, and we did this, this, this. And he doesn't say anything remarkable about it. It's, it's matter of fact. And so what I'm trying to point out here is if you see it as extraordinary and mystical, it really isn't from those who actually experience it. It only seems that way because they're distanced from it. But when you actually are in there, it's rather ordinary. So this is, I'm just throwing this out in a little bit in advance. Um, even after he discovered the right way, his mind's still away. Uh, da, 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 sightseeing tours. How did I get down here again? Whoa, my computer jumped. It ran off. <laughs> it's <just> some realm. <laughs> Where did we just finish? 
message in the early days when he was not able to keep up with his own nimble and overactive mind, it often troubled him by pain being truant. When, for example, he forced it to contemplate the body down to the feet, it would flash out of the body and penetrate into the ground. When, on the other hand, it was brought back into the body, in an instant it jumped upwards into the air, flitting back and forth there with pleasure and delight, showing no interest in coming back down. Only with forcible pull of mindfulness could it be made to obey and come back to the body for contemplative purposes. The state of one-pointedness at that stage came forth deep and strong, so that mindfulness was able to keep up with it. This was like a person suddenly falling down a precipice, reaching the ground instantly, but the mind remained only for a moment in that profound and unshakable condition. It would then withdraw and enter the next lower stage called, and he calls it upakara samadhi, literally, entering the wandering within. It then wandered without control, catching glimpses of things here and there in the various planes of consciousness. So uh, I won't go more into this. If, if you're interested, uh, we'll do this, finish this up next week. It, it's just another section. If it's not that interesting, we'll go back. But I thought you might find it interesting for a number of levels, but as a concrete illustration of what Han Chan's talking about. Okay? Um, these may or may not be states that you had, or may not be states you will have. But if these states do arise, the advantage of this is that you're getting from someone who's gone through it a kind of teacher who can give you some ballast if and when these things do happen. And then you won't waste time like he did. This is really important. A lot of the better teachings are sort of these... Uh, direct personal encounters uh, that are so important to read that read between the lines of the text. So I can you can say let your mind be unattached, clinging to nothing. That's the principle. But when these things happen, your your consciousness leaves your body and goes off to the heavens or hells. You're thinking, let my mind be attached, clinging. No, at that point, you know you're already. So when you realize that somebody's been through this within your lifetime, more or less and has left a record behind of guidance, you can call these things up and say, ah, I remember Ajahn Mun said, blah, 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 you know. And then you're, so this is the importance of the living tradition. This is the importance of the inspired tradition as opposed to just the text. Okay, I finish with one poem. I want to do a poem tonight, and then we'll be done. Um, it came to me this week, I don't know why. I was giving a, a, a talk at Cal. Um, too bad you weren't there because I talked about the Platform Sutra and how it came about, which is what you wanted to hear. <laughs> Anyhow, um, yeah, this is a poem I like a lot. Everybody know this poem? Uh, do you know the poet? That's Emily Dickinson, right. Um, another person who's recognized after she passes on So this, this goes to this idea of, remember we, we did the, um, the Tao Te Ching, that passage, and we said, um, to people of the world, the way seems like folly. They're blown adrift and it never stopped. Da, 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 that, remember that passage? Never sure, the, not crisp and confident. So this is another turn of it. She says, much madness is divinest sense. Meaning? Excuse me? What we call crazy is really right. So a kind of madness that we call crazy could be, in fact, something that's close to the divine, to the holy, to the spiritual. To a discerning eye, meaning someone who really sees things as they are, much sense, <laughs> the starkest madness. So again, I go back to the Tao Te Ching. He says, people of the way, people of the world think our way is a greatly, greatly folly. But it's only because it's great it seems like folly. As for the things of the world that people think are great, no question about their folly. So here's Emily Dickinson saying pretty much the same thing. Tis the majority in this as all prevail. So the common opinion, the common understanding, that's what's going to rule. And then she says, assent and go along with it, and you are sane. Demur, you're straightaway dangerous and handled with a chain. <laughs> so
So, again, now the reason I thought of this is because in the talk, this quote came up, that people of the way that are cultivating can seem a little bit off, because they're not after all the things, and they don't put on the show, and they don't play the games. But what also came up was the Sixth Patriarch talking about people who sit in meditation to escape reality and enter oblivious states of sitting in dull emptiness. Then I turned around and said, but sometimes much divine ascent is madness. So much madness can be divine ascent, but so can divine ascent be much madness. <laughs> it can go either way. So again, it's pointing to a little bit, I guess that's why I chose it, but um, Ajahn Mun was talking about tonight, was there was a divine sense to him at the beginning, but it really was a kind of madness. It really was a kind of madness. And he talks about in his tradition, sometimes people like this become honored and worshiped because people think they're mediums to the other world. And they take on this status of being magical. And again, he's later in his thing, he warns about this. So when you see what he's saying here about if you have these abilities, it doesn't mean anything, but if you take them to be something significant, you, you get a kind of madness, and people won't be able to tell. They'll think you're actually awakened. So you have to be very careful. So I, I like this much madness and divine ascents, but as we cultivate, just realize some divine ascents can be much madness. Hmm. Okay. Any announcements? Nothing? Things coming up? Starting at what time? Okay, tomorrow night, Avatamska uh, winter class. Amelia? Monday, 7.30? In the kitchen? Oh, here in the Buddha Hall. Okay. All right, uh, that being it, uh, I think we'll do transference in English. and wise.